So this morning we're in the book of, uh, what book are we in, guys? Good job. So we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I just want to remind people uh, what the book of 1 Corinthians, it's been a couple weeks since we've been in it. The book of 1 Corinthians is written by the Apostle Paul. Paul had planted a church in Corinth, and, and what I actually, I, I looked it up just to be sure. The church in Corinth was less than three years old when he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians to them. So it was a church plant that was less than three years old, which is great for us, a church plant that's less than three years old. We're just on our third year now. Uh, and I felt like the Lord was putting on 1 Corinthians on my heart as a church plant in a similar situation to take heed to the warnings, to the rebuke, and to the edification that Paul gives to the church of Corinth. I believe that it was edifying for them then, and it's edifying for us now. So we're in 1 Corinthians, we're in chapter 3. Uh, today's verses are going to be 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Now, up until this point, uh, the 1 Corinthians has been about really one major overarching theme, and that's division in the church. Uh, this idea that some people were following Apollos, others were following Paul, others were following Cephas, even still some were following Christ, and, and they were using who they were following as a divisive point. And Paul wasn't saying it's wrong to follow Paul or to follow Apollos or Cephas or Christ. Uh, what he was saying is it's wrong to take pride in that, to look down on your fellow believer because you like Apollos' teachers, teachings better than Paul's teachings. Or because we're non-denominational, sometimes we're like, well, we just follow Christ, so we're better than you Methodists who follow John Wesley, right? Paul calls that out too. He says if you're being divisive because you follow Christ instead of Paul, it's just as wrong. He says, look, we need to stop being divisive and we need to be united as one body. Then he furthers that point by talking about humility. How, and that's where we got the Be the Fool series, right? Where he talks about humbling ourselves. If we realized how low we really were, then we wouldn't even have these foolish divisions because we would be so utterly dependent on Christ. Dude, whose kid is that? I know, right? Do it. Now we get to today's, today's passage. I want to read this. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do you not know that you are God's temple? Now, when you read this verse for the, for the first time, if you take it out of context, if you forget what this letter is about, and many Christians do this. They take this, do you not know that you are God's temple? And they apply it to themselves as an individual. And they're saying, see, we are individually God's temple. And it is true in, in chapter 6 that Paul talks about each and every one of us individually being God's temple. But at this particular point in the letter, here in verse 16, Paul's not talking to the individual. He's talking to the church. He's, he's, he's been talking to the church this whole time. Every time he's saying you, he's saying you, the church in Corinth. You, the church in Corinth, are God's temple. And so eventually, and we'll get there as we get to chapter 6, we'll talk about us individually as the temple. But what he's not talking about is being healthy. All right? I just want to make that very clear. Because people take this verse, and, and health nuts use this, and they say, well, don't you know that you're God's temple? Anyone who destroys God's temple will be destroyed by God. If that is the case, then somebody needs to warn Taco Bell for destroying my body. Because God's about to rain fire and brimstone down on them. I'm telling you. Flip a Taco Bell. That Westdale Taco Bell. Destroy me, man. That's not what he's, that's not what the case for was. Why did I say that? I vowed to my wife that I would never eat Taco Bell again. It's bad for our marriage. But dude, that case of loop is good. My mouth's all watering. Thanks, Dustin. So what he is talking about is he's talking about the church. He's saying, church in Corinth, you, the body of believers, the building and those who fellowship inside of it, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? It dwells amongst you, church. It's there when you fellowship, where two or three of you are gathered. God's spirit is there, and thus you are God's temple. And so it is with Christian Life Church, with this building, with these, these two rooms that we fellowship in, with this congregation of believers. We, as a church, are the temple of God. The church downstairs, the sanctuary. Them, as a church, is the temple of God. 
When two or three believers, regardless of what congregation they go to, when they gather together as a congregation, they together are a temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells there. The church that meets in Africa under the big tree, and that, that tree around it, and those who gather around it, man, that tree is the temple of God. You guys pick it up when I'm laying down. I want you to get the right context of this verse. And, and, and honestly, I didn't even know this until I was studying for today's sermon. Because when I read it, I, I definitely thought he was talking about us personally. And then I started to read the commentaries. It made abundant sense. Look, Paul's talking to the church here. If he just changed it and started talking about health, it would make no sense in the context. So he's saying, you church, you are the temple of God. You guys following me so far? So I just want to give you all a, a quick lesson this morning about the significance of the temple of God. Because sometimes we as American believers who don't have the Jewish history and the Jewish roots, we, we don't understand the significance of this word temple. For, for Paul to be saying, you are the temple of God, what's the significance behind that? Uh, the, the significance is this, that the temple historically has always been the place on earth where God decides to dwell. Right? In, in, the garden of, in the Garden of Eden, God's original plan, his perfect plan for us, was to be walking with him, talking with him, fellowshipping with him. Right? To, to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He wanted to be close with us. But we messed that up. And, and, and we, we ate of the forbidden fruit, and part of our punishment was separation from him. But God has always desired to be close to us. And so now there's a separation. And, and quickly, God began to come back and to be close with us again. First, he did it with, with the Ark of the Covenant. He said, build this Ark, and I will send my Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to indwell in that Ark so that I can be close with you. So that I can be with you amongst the camps. Uh, he did it in the burning bush where he came to the burning bush. The Ark of the Covenant traveled and they made this special tent and they called it the tabernacle. And that tabernacle was the first temple built by man's hands for God to dwell within it. And then King Solomon said, look, we need something better than this, just this Ark. All of us people have these beautiful homes and God's got this box. We need to make something better for him. And so Solomon, David said that, and Solomon uh, built the temple that, that David had envisioned. And Solomon built this beautiful, ornate temple. And in this temple, there was this place called the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, that is where God dwelt. God indwelt inside the Holy of Holies. And, and, and if you don't know, I, I'm giving you a lot of theology here. I, for most of us, this is just kind of a recap. Uh, holiness means separation from sin. It means to be separate from. God is holy. He, he cannot be in the presence of sin. And so God would dwell in the holy of holies. And it would be such a holy place that only one person would be allowed to go in it, the high priest. And he could only go in it after, after uh, sacrificing and, and putting all of his sins uh, on the sacrifice of being forgiven from his sin. And then when he would go in, they would tie a rope around his legs. Because oftentimes, if that priest had any sin on him, and he tried, he dared to go into the Holy of Holies, he would die. God would strike him down dead, because God doesn't want to be in the presence of sin. And so then they'd have to, like, tug on the rope and pull him out. Nobody else wants to go in there, because we all know we're sinful, right? So that's the temple. It's always been this hugely important religious place, where, where everyone who was religious would go, and they would want to be close to God. And so they would get as close to the Holy of Holies as they were allowed to get. And they would worship there, and they would praise there, and they would sacrifice there. And Paul is saying, you, church, are now that temple. You are that temple in which God dwells. You are that Holy of Holies. For God's temple is holy. He'll destroy them if you destroy it. John 16, 5 through 7. Would you bring that up for me? John 16, 5 through 7. But now I'm going, this is Jesus talking, to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow has filled their heart because they know Jesus is about to die. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that you go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. The Helper is a name for the Holy Spirit. We just read this in, uh, in, in Wednesday service, and we talked about it. And, and I find it amusing that God always lines up what we read on Wednesday with what he's having me preach on Sunday. Um, and so God's, what Jesus is saying is he's saying, look, 
when I die, something's going to happen. The Holy Spirit, you've always known him to be in the holiest of holies. You've always known him to be in this temple, in this room, boxed up, where only one person can go. But when I die, something special is going to happen. I'm going to send that Holy Spirit out of the temple, out of the Holy of Holies, and I'm going to send him to you. He's talking both to individuals, as we'll talk about when we get to chapter 6, but also to the body of believers. So first, God was in the garden with us. Then he was in the Ark of the Covenant. Then Solomon's Temple. Then he came to us individually and as the church. And one day, we'll be celebrating with Jesus, walking and talking with him uh, on the streets of gold in New Jerusalem, just as it was intended for us to be doing in the Garden of Eden. We're going to get back there. And look what happens when Jesus dies. Matthew 27, 50 through 51. This is so amazing. If you've never studied this, this is what happens with, when Jesus dies. Matthew 27, 50, for 50, 50 through 51. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The curtain of the temple was this very incredibly thick curtain. It wasn't like some curtain from Ikea. All right? It was decorative. It was this very thick, thick curtain. And, and that curtain was what was separating the Holy of Holies from just the holy place. That was the, the curtain that the, the, the high priest had to pass through with the rope on his foot. That's what separated where the Holy Spirit was to where he wasn't. When Jesus died, the veil was torn. It was cut down in two. The Holy Spirit was no longer contained into a room. The Holy Spirit now left. And he, where did he go? Jesus said, I'm sending him to you, to the believers, to the church, to the temple. That should be exciting. I'm excited about that. Yes. And what's crazy, I love, I don't ever tell Amanda what I'm preaching about before she picks out songs. She picks out songs before I even write my sermon. Um, I love this song that we sang, the second to last song, where it says, Spirit of God, come and fill this place. Because that's exactly what it's talking about. Spirit of God, come and fill this place. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, my first point this morning is that the church is the temple of God. That the church is the temple of God. The church, both the building in which we fellowship and we as the body of believers, that is the temple of God. And, and, and maybe you've heard me pray before. And you've heard me say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, come. That song that we sang, Spirit of God, would you come and fill this place? Because I truly believe that before Jesus died, there was a place that was filled with the Holy Spirit. And now Jesus has made a way for this room right here to be that place. For the room downstairs, the, the sanctuary, to be that place. For the Methodist church across the street, to be that place. That God has made a way for us to be the temple of God. And it's important that you guys grasp this as we go into our next few points. That truly, we are the temple of God. That this place is God's temple. Go back to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? Again, talking to the church. Don't you know? Don't you know that the spirit of God is here? Don't you know that you are God's temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you? I mean, I don't know about y'all, church, but I can feel it when God shows up. I can feel the weight of the Holy Spirit just falling on this place. Something about my spirit overtakes my flesh. And no longer am I that person who came in who was this body who was warring with flesh and, and with spirit. But when I get close to God, it's like my, my flesh stays at the door. And all of a sudden, I'm just with I remember when I first got saved and I first experienced the Holy Spirit coming down on our church with Pastor Matt who can't sing or play piano, play, leading worship. He can't, man. But I'll tell you what, that guy faithfully serves because he was playing in a church just like we're doing here. And he didn't have amazing Amanda to play for him. And so he would get up and he would leave because someone had to do it. And the Holy Spirit came and fell on the place. And I remember the first time I experienced it. And I left that building saying, I never knew joy before today. I never knew joy before I was with the Holy Spirit. I was walking with him and talking with him and worshiping. And I didn't care that the piano wasn't quite right and that the singing was kind of off too. What I cared about was that I was with my God. 
That's joy. And that's what happens in this place when the Holy Spirit comes. So then we get to point two. Anyone who destroys God's temple will be destroyed. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone therefore destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Now Paul up until this point has been talking about division. Division in the church, division amongst the brothers. He's not changing gears here. He's not changing his tune. What he's saying is he's saying, look, your division is destroying God's temple. Your division is destroying the place in which the Holy Spirit dwells. Your division is going into the Holy of Holies and is destroying it, is tearing it down. It's, it's like it's spreading pig's blood all over the walls like the heathens would do when they took over Jerusalem. That's what your division is doing to God's temple. And, and, and to, to people who understood what the temple was and who understood what this word holy meant, they understood exactly what Paul was saying. It was a very serious thing which he was leveling to. Up until this point, he'd been kind of a little bit light sometimes, and, and, and he had switched gears, and he focused on himself, and now he's making it very serious. Look, your division is destroying the temple of God. And if you destroy the temple of God, God will destroy you. So look, guys, as a young pastor in a young church, I can tell you 100% of the time, I, I see this all the time, 100%, all the time. I see people who come into our church to try to destroy it. I see people who come into our church looking for Christ, and then their flesh overtakes them and they try to destroy it. I've had moments in my own flesh where I've done things to destroy it. I know it happens, and we need to be on guard, because I don't want to be destroyed, and I don't want anyone else to be destroyed, and I certainly don't want this temple to be destroyed. Amen. Amen. It's not just my job to be on the lookout. It's your job to be on the lookout as well. Look at Romans 16, 17 through 18. Romans 16, 17 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and who create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve the Lord Christ, but their own appetite. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause division. He's not talking to pastors. He's talking to church members. He's talking to the church of Rome. I appeal to you, church members, watch out for those who cause division, who create obstacles contrary to the doctrine which you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Such people who come to divide, who come to, to come uh, to spread lies in order to destroy the church, those people are not Christians. Paul makes it clear. There's no room for them to be Christians in this verse. He says, such people do not serve the Lord. Such people do not serve the Lord. I'm talking now about people who come in to secretly try to turn church member against church member, to turn church against pastor, to turn church against a different church. People who speak bad about this church or its leadership. Be on the lookout for such people. This is God's temple. We're its guardians and we're its servants. We're like the Levites. We're in charge of this temple. God has entrusted each and every single one of us. As a church member of CLC, he said, this congregation is your congregation. I am entrusting it to you. So be on the lookout for people who would come to destroy it. When you befriend someone, and maybe they start coming to church, and all they start doing is talking bad about someone else in the church. They're not there to unite the church. They're there to destroy it. It's happened in this church more than once before, where people come in, and all of a sudden, I'm getting texts about this person, and they're saying this about that person, and they're doing this about that person, and I'm just like, what is going on here? Why is my church being destroyed from the inside out? Because there are people who are coming to destroy the church of God. Such people are Christians. 
And it's, it's not our job to call them out either. It's not our job to be like, how dare you? It's our job to love them and to pray for them that they will be saved. But we need to be on the lookout. We have no business being in divisive talk. If someone comes to me and they're like, man, did you hear what Dominique did? And he's such a scumbag. And this and the other thing. I'm going to rebuke them in the name of Jesus. I'm going to say, that's my brother in Christ. How dare you talk about him like that? This is my church. And I'm not going to let it be divided. Amen? Amen. When someone comes in and tries to, tries to take a leadership position, this happens all the time too. This blows my mind. It cracks me up. When people come in and they just try to quickly take a leadership position in our church, I don't know them. I don't know where they come from. And they're just like, hey, man, hey, uh, you know, uh, I came from Texas, and, and I've preached a thousand sermons to a million people. And I really think that I can do a great thing here, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, great. Where's your church? Oh, you know, I don't have a home church right now, but I, I'm telling you, man, I'm a great preacher. And, I, and I'm just like, really? You preach to a million people, and you want to come and preach at our little church? Little. Little. Fifteen people church, something red flags go up. Red flags go up when people come boasting about themselves and trying to take a leadership position. Because I, I take these words seriously. I believe that there are people who come in order to seek and destroy this church. I have seen it happen in other churches where people come in and they act all spiritual and they act all holy and they try to stand up and then all the next thing you know there's this church split because this one spiritual leader who, who no one knew but someone took his word for it came in and started preaching and then turned the church against each other. Be on the lookout for such people. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Mm. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I, I don't know how to say that any better. I would rather have a wolf in wolf's clothing than a sheep in wolf's clothing, I'll tell you that. Mm. This is the reason why, just a serious example, because we have had people come in and ask to preach that I have said no to who have told me how great of preachers that they are, and how holy they are, and how God's got a message. And I've been like, no. This is why I will let Will preach once a month, no problem. Even though he's only preached once before he came to this church. Because I know Will. And I know his heart. And I know whom he's serving. And he didn't come and come begging to me to preach. In fact, I asked him to preach before he asked me to preach. Because I'm looking at him and I'm saying, that's a sheep. And someone comes in who looks like a sheep, I don't know them. And I'm going to protect this church, and I'm going to protect this flock. I ask you to do the same, church. Man, you got to be on the lookout. People will try to destroy this church, and I will not have it. We will not have a church split here in the name of Jesus. Amen. I don't care how small or how big we are, we will be united. I'm not letting people come in here to destroy our church, amen? amen. And, 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 and I ask you, church, to be on the lookout as well. Whether you stay here for the rest of your life, or you move away and you go to another church, be on the lookout, man. Church splits are not godly in any way, shape, or form. God doesn't desire it. God doesn't want it. It's sinful. It's of the devil. And I, and I don't want anyone in here to be a part of that. Amen. This church is God's tenant. Let's not stand for it, church. Point three. God's temple is holy. God's temple is holy. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17, once again. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. God's temple is holy. That means we, church, we are holy. This is a holy place. This is a holy building. This is a holy congregation of believers. You have holy fellowship with one another. That word is a very serious word. It doesn't mean you look holy, but sometimes aren't. It doesn't mean that you, you, you try your best. It means that you are holy, that God has made you holy, that he has set you apart, that he has set you apart from sin. Whether you're fellowshipping with one another, whether you're fellowshipping in this church or outside of this church, you as God's temple are holy. Leviticus 20, 20, uh, Leviticus 20 verse 26 says this, You shall be holy to me. For I am the Lord, and I am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Leviticus 20, 26, uh, this is God instructing Moses about God's chosen people, the chosen nation, the Israelites, who we are a part of as Christians, we are grafted in, so we can claim this for ourselves. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. 
and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. We are to be separated from the world. Let me say that again. We are to be separated from the world. We are to be separate from the world. Holy means separated, set apart. We are different. We shouldn't look the same as the world. We shouldn't act the same as the world. We shouldn't sound the same as the world. We are set apart. We are holy as God is holy. This building is holy. It's set apart. It's why I don't allow secular music to be played in here. I don't. This is a holy building. I might play secular music in my car every once in a while when I want to listen to Taylor Swift shake it off or whatever. But we don't play that in here. This is a holy building. It's why I don't allow video games to be played in here that are full of curse words and sin. I don't want that infecting my church. That's why when we watch movies, if they're secular movies, they're going to be well vetted because I'm going to make sure that there's no garbage filling our church. Because it's a holy place. That's why I talk to the kids on Wednesday when they're being disrespectful when we're praying because we're a holy place. And I want them to respect that holiness, to understand that holiness. That's why I go out of my way to make sure that nothing we do is sinful as a church. I used to uh, download a lot of illegal software because software is expensive and it's really easy to steal. And so I would download it, especially as a techie. Even, after, even as a Christian, even as a pastor, I repented from a lot of sin, but I still had this sin where I would download uh, Adobe Master Collection. That's like the, the, the best piece of software you can have as a computer creative artist. Um, and I would make websites, and I would do graphic design. And it's like a, like a, like a $1,300 piece of software, like just at the base. It's like $4,000 if you want the whole thing. And it would take me like 20 minutes to illegally download it. No one would know. And, and I was like, man, I'm doing God's work with this. And when God called me to come plant this church and to go to Singapore, he convicted me of that. He says, I'm asking you to do something holy. Why would you base that on stolen software? And so I repented. And I, un and I, I, I erased all the stolen software on my computer. And I, and I said, I'll never do it again. And I haven't since then, praise the Lord. And I remember getting to Singapore. And someone in Singapore, they said, you know how to do graphic design? And I was like, yeah, I do. I love graphic design, web page design, and all that. They said, man, we've needed a graphic design. And so this one of the top guys in the church brought me out to lunch. This is a, a 6,000 people church. And one of the top guys in the church wanted to sit down with me for lunch to talk about graphic design. He just throws out this whole design project. He was like, can you do this? And I was like, oh, sure. And I was like, oh, but I don't have the software to do it. But I said yes, and I said I'm going to, I'm going to be faithful. And lo and behold, Adobe has like this, this period of time where you can like try it for like a week. And I was like, I guess I'll just try to get it done in a week over the trial period. And as I'm doing that, I get a phone call from someone who wants to donate the entire software to me and, and, and my ministry. And they say, listen, I just feel like I want to buy this software for you. And they didn't buy the base model. They bought the $3,500 models so that my ministry could have a legal way to do what we do. So our church's website was built on that. Our logo was built on that. A lot of our videos are done on that. And I go out of my way to make sure we're not doing anything illegally because our church is holy. You guys picking up what I'm laying down? Yep. So here's where it comes down to you. You and your congregation and your interaction, me and my, and, and, and my interaction with you and with other Christians, we are just as much the temple as this room is. Do we take the same approach to our lives when we're outside of the church? We take the same approach to our fellowship. Do we understand that we are the temple of God when we congregate together where two or three are gathered? He is surely there. Do we say, man, we need to be holy? Do we look at it? Do we do everything we can to make sure there's no sin involved? I'm, I'm talking about, so like, for, for example, just this is, a, this is just an example that happened last night, right? Me and Scott and Trent went out to see WWE together because Trent loves WWE. It is terrible and stupid and it's boring. <laughs> Trent, I hope you're not watching this. Because um, he loves it, man. He's all about it. And it was his birthday. So we were like, let's get him a... It was his birthday a couple months ago, but we had just heard about this and we really wanted to go. So we got him tickets. And so we go with him to love on him. And me and Scott and Trent, as Christians, as believers, fellowshipping together, we are the temple of God. We are holy. We, we, anyone destroys that, that fellowship that the three of us have, God will destroy them. That includes us, the three of us. 
And so as I'm hanging out with them, I'm thinking to myself, what's my conduct like? Am, am I telling inappropriate jokes? Am I, am I, uh, am I looking at, at women who aren't dressed appropriately a little bit too long? A am I allowing us to badmouth other people? And as I'm fellowshipping together, I'm remembering, you know what? This fellowship should be holy just as much as Sunday morning should be holy. And the world should be able to look at us and, and see that we're holy. And that doesn't mean we don't have fun. I mean, we have a blast, right? I ain't got no problem with Star hitting someone in the back with a chair for, for, for a quick laugh. Dude, that's awesome stuff. There's nothing wrong with having fun. It doesn't mean that me and Scott and Trent don't have fun together. Man, we had a blast. But I want to make sure that as we are fellowshipping together, because if the Bible's true and we're two or three are gathered, he's sure will be there, then I want to make sure that when I'm with him, that I am conducting myself in a holy manner. And so I challenge you too, church, to live your life like that. It's Matthew 18, 20 that says that. For where two or three are gathered in his name, there I am among him. And that means that I don't go out with my buddies after church and get plastered, right? I don't just go drink until I can't walk anymore. Because I want to be holy. I want to be set apart. I want my friends to be set apart. I have known churches where the men's group will get together and we'll be all holy in the men's group and then we'll go out and get drunk together. I'm like, just because you're in the bar and you're not in the church doesn't mean you're no longer the temple of God. Doesn't mean that God is no longer there amongst you. Doesn't mean that you're not supposed to be holy unto the world. And so that's, that's what I'm reminded of today. I'm not here to play church. I'm not here to, to just be like, all right, man, on Sunday we're going to feel good. Man, I 100% believe that there is a living and a alive God. And I 100% believe that the Holy Spirit is with me when I'm gathered with two or three other people, as the Word of God says. And I 100% believe that that is supposed to be a holy place. And if that's the case, man, I need to live like that. I need to take captive every thought in my mind and remind myself the holy presence of God is with us right now. Father, I just ask that we would all remember that. Lord, that, that none of us would, would think that just because we're in, we're in church or not in church that our behavior should be different. Father, that, that none of us would ever think well, I'm going to church, so I should behave this way. But then we would think, well, I serve a holy God, and He is with me, and so I should behave that way. Lord, I want to be holy so that I can be with you. Father, I don't want to be like the priest that has to be pulled out of the tabernacle with a rope. Father, I want to walk with you and talk with you. I want to be holy. And then, Father, I thank you so much that through Jesus Christ you have provided a way for me to be holy. That you have provided that sacrifice. That you have provided a way for every person in this room to be holy. That you've provided the sacrificial lamb. Father, I pray that we don't take advantage of that sacrifice. Lord, that we don't mock it and scoff it. And that we don't have to continually just... Uh, 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 be coming back in shame, but that we can live in victory, the victory that you've already won. Father, I pray that as we fellowship together, that truly we would be having church, that we'd be having church at Panera, and we'd be, we'd be having church while watching Downton Abbey together. <laughs> that we'd be having church, that we'd be having church whenever we fellowship together, that we would be your temple, Holy Spirit, I pray that you open up our eyes to see you more. To see you while we're hanging out together. To see you while we're fellowshipping with one another and with other believers. Father, I pray that the world would look at us and they would see that we are different. And Father, I know that most of them will hate us for it. That's okay because they hated you first. Father, I pray that we would be bold enough to live like we believe in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So church, uh, Amanda, I'll have you come up and just play something this morning. Um, sure. Just pawn the baby off on something. Man, I know it's a, it's a heavy message this morning, but I believe it was even heavier for those in Corinth who, who had that full understanding. And so I'll, I'll always say this. The beauty about Christianity 
is that God tells us what we're doing wrong before he judges us for doing it wrong. And that's nothing to be upset about. If a cop pulls you over and says, I want you to know you're going 20 miles over the speed limit and there's a speed trap up there, and that cop's going to give you a ticket up there, you're not going to be mad at that cop. You're going to be like, really? You're telling me about a speed trap? You're going to be so grateful. That's what God does to us when he convicts us. He's just saying, look, man, something's wrong, but that's okay. There's plenty of time to fix it. I want to help you. And so this morning, if this sermon was convicting to you, you'd be like, man, I'm and I'm, it's convicting to me. I'm sure it's convicting to all of us. I know that, that not, we're not perfect. Take that conviction and be grateful for it. Lord, thank you so much for revealing this to me. And do something about it. Don't drive away from the cop and keep going 20 miles over the same country. Right? You thank that cop, you say thank you when you start going this way. And so it is when God shows us conviction in his scripture and he says, look, church, something might be a little bit off here. There might be a little bit of division amongst you. There might be some who are trying to destroy you. Even you yourself might be, could, could be having conduct that could be destroying my temple. Our response would be, thank you so much, Lord, for showing us that. Now help me live it. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand just as we worship